Cold open, I've only been a Zelda fan for the last few years, but now, after all this time, I, Drew the Doodled Man, have obtained all six of the main 3D Zelda games. Count them. As I was writing this video, I finished my very first playthrough of Twilight Princess on my dusty old Wii, and playing this specific Zelda game brought a new question into my brain zone. Is Nintendo obsessed with Ocarina of Time? Ocarina of Time is a fantastic game to me. I'm willing to acknowledge its flaws, cramped, empty overworld, boring dialogue that moves at a slug's pace, items with limited utility, ocarina that seems cool until you realize you can really only use it for a few puzzles and warping, having to zip to the temple of time to switch time periods every single time. That's a lot of times. But I think there are a lot of positive aspects. The maze-like dungeons, magnificent setting, standout music, that all contribute towards telling a sort of cheesy but pretty darn effective story about growing up and overcoming your trials. It's really empowering and uplifting. And even if you don't like Ocarina of Time, you can't say it's a lie that it was extremely influential. It shook up and created new standards for 3D action adventure games, so as far as large stuffs for games, this game is up there. Like, way up. Its historical significance is enough to give the game a shot, I think, anyway. But that's not exactly what I'm here to babble about today. See, this baby was critically acclaimed and sold 1.14 million copies. Simply put, it made bank. I speculate this led to the obsession I talked about earlier. Remember that? I guess I should really explain what I'm thinking. If Twilight Princess is anything to go by, then the 3D Zeldas developed a nasty habit of forcing a connection to Ocarina due to its success. Does that make sense? When this occurred to me, I wondered how true it was. So today, I'm gonna go through each game and see if, and if so, how the trend developed. Do these games show signs of unhealthy obsession with their older sibling, or am I noticing no thing? The success of Ocarina of Time made Nintendo get all goo-eyed for Zelda, so they cranked up the old Zelda machine again and got to work. I'm not gonna gab about I'm not gonna gab about the whole development since it isn't really relevant to this video, but the point is it led to Majora's Mask being released one year and five months later. The closeness must mean they just wanted to cash in, right? This game must be full of references to the last one. Actually, no. Huh, what a surprise. Surprise. It does reference the plot of the last game, but really only as an excuse to transition into a new story. This time, Link is looking for his missing friend Navi from before. However, this leads to him entering the weird parallel world of Termina, and having to save the world from an astral accident. Nobody wants the moon to crash into the world. Zelda makes an appearance one time as a memory that teaches you the Song of Time. So instead of continuing the Hyrule story, they drop it and focus on a Groundhog Day concept. Interesting. Even the reused character models have an excuse. This is a parallel world, so of course they're gonna be lookalike people. The story also stands out by having some way darker overtones. Sure, Ocarina did some dark stuff too. I mean, as a child, all the areas are really fun and colorful and have all these neat characters. But when you come back as an adult, the marketplace is destroyed. All the Gorons are gonna get fed to a dragon, and Zora's domain is frozen over. But it mostly used the suffering of the different areas to remind you about how Ganondorf is the big bad guy you need to rise above and stab. In Majora's Mask, you see people reacting to the crisis of the moon falling. No matter where you go in the game, people are dealing with the short time they have left and losses of different kinds. The Deku King's daughter is missing, and he takes it out by trying to execute an innocent monkey. Lily the Zora Singer has lost her eggs and her voice out of depression. So instead of there being one big bad driving you to make these people's lives better, this game shows you that if you give up and let the moon fall, there will be no hope for these people. Talk about depressing. But what about the actual game part of the game? Hmm? Majora's Mask decides to expand the gameplay elements from the first game. The time travel ideas are used in a different way, first of all. Instead of the two time periods from before, Link now repeats the same three-day cycle. 
which means the ocarina is given more use and utility beyond warping since now Link has to actually use it to manipulate time, starting over, skipping ahead, or even just slowing down the flow. Plus, instead of just being an equipable item for one side quest, the masks are fleshed out into being full-on transformations for Link. Now he can have the powers of a Deku Scrub, a Goron, and a Zora, not to mention all the other masks with, well, I mean, you know, different different levels of usefulness. Some of them, some of them, some of them just kind of just kind of sit there on your face. In the case of Majora, it seems like it doesn't depend on Ocarina's existence to be a good game. It uses continuation from Ocarina of Time as an excuse to do the things that it does. The parallel world using the same character models, the expanded gameplay ideas, even the story all owe their base existence to Ocarina. But the game takes them in a new direction that makes Majora's Mask escape the shadow of its older brother and find its own identity. The game says, yeah, Oot did this. Now watch me do something totally different. Wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. Bias alert! This was the first Zelda game I ever played through. I might do a full video on some other aspect of the game, but let's just stick to the topic at hand, huh? This game has some big changes up its sleeve, taking place on a big open ocean and features some new races as well. It even shakes up the musical instrument tradition. Instead of an ocarina, Link uses the Wind Waker as a baton to conduct the gusts in the air. Not to mention the expanded combat with reaction commands to deal with armored enemies, and golly gosh, this game's more goofy and cartoony art style really lends a sense of childlike optimism to the game. Big contrast from Majora for sure. From its opening cutscene though, The Wind Waker makes it very clear that this is a story sequel to Ocarina. There doesn't really seem to be any reason to do this, at least to me, anyway. With such a different setting and art style, that would be the perfect opportunity to tell a different type of Zelda story like Majora's Mask did. Maybe because of the different setting of the last game, they wanted to go back to the roots and make people more comfortable? I'm guessing that's what happened. I guess at least they let you know right off the bat. The entry sums up Ocarina's story and states this is an old legend told in this new game's world. So once again, you gotta go get the magical things to stop Ganondorf. Along the way, learning that the ocean is actually covering up ancient Eki Hyrule under the waves. As far as being a continuation, it actually is pretty good, I will admit. The references to Ocarina are mostly done in ways that stay away from getting in your face, like the stained glasses of the sages in the castle. I think that's the best way to do something like this, acknowledgement without being in your face about it. Even though the story can get very heavy-handed with its referencing, at least it does enough to establish this game as a different world that does things in its own way. Nowhere is that more clear than with this game's exploration. Instead of one big field you gotta walk all over to get all the extras, now you have to sail across the Great Sea to explore a bunch of different islands, all of them being small chunks of extras that have been easily split up. Some may have more meaningful content than others, but this was a good introduction to a different kind of Zelda exploration than we were used to. But back to the sequel story. This is my favorite part. The game has a really fantastic ending, where the King of Hyrule wishes for Hyrule to get washed away and the ocean caves in on it. The King literally states that he wants Link and Zelda to find their own land and make it their own. In that sense, this is really a goodbye to Ocarina of Time, which, in the context of this game's story and the fact that it was the most current Zelda when it came out, I mean, I'm, ca I'm Captain Obvious over here, is really shocking and emotional. The Wind Waker's attitude towards Ocarina of Time seems to be looking back with respect, also avoiding any obsession. It involves the world of that game without sacrificing too much individuality. The ocean-based exploring, new fighting abilities, and funny character designs all contribute to this game standing really well on its own. It's also a great send-off to the world of the past, which gives a pretty heartwarming lesson. Remember the past, but don't be too afraid to embrace the future. Too bad Nintendo doesn't really like to listen to themselves, apparently.